Okay. Make sure I got everything I need here. Okay, uh, Scotty, go ahead and pop that up. You are listening to Wisp Turlington. Through the years, through the tears. A Hunter House audiobook. To my family. You were wrong. Introduction. Hell is a hell of a place. I know. I've worked there for over 40 years. Who am I? I'm with Turlington. Who are you? If you don't have the thought inside you of who you are, you don't have the strength to finish this book. Return it to your place of original purchase and get 5% back. I don't need it. In this book, you're going to hear a lot of things that shock you. I am not holding back this time. I held back the first time I tried this shit with my 1973 autobiography, Wisp This. Robert Plant told me not to share too much, and I fucking listened to him. Golden gods can be wrong. (laughs) Oh, so wrong. You're going to hear a lot of things that frighten you. But tough shit. I'm not changing a word. I wrote this during a pandemic when I didn't have anything better to do. And now that I can move around a little bit more, there's no going back. I truthfully have no idea what I wrote in this book. Robert Plant told me recently that one should have a good idea of what's in their book. And I said, kick rocks, Plant. You're not going to fuck me this time. Jimmy Page was standing nearby and, and it made him laugh. And that made me feel good. Some friends are going to hate this book. Some are going to curse my name right before they walk out on stage at some fucking backwoods casino on a Tuesday night. I get it. Hearing how great shit turned out for me could be hard to hear. I'm also not going to start this book with some fucking wisp was born in Valverde blah 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 bullshit. You know I was born. I wouldn't fucking be here if I wasn't born. You want the good stuff. You want me to get right to the coke stories. You want me to immediately tell you how David Bowie and I pranked Ian Hunter and Queen's John Deacon at the Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert, an actual crime that has never been admitted to until today. That's the shit you want. That's the shit you get. So sit back and relax as we travel through the years and through the tears. Chapter 1. Huey Lewis. Call me Ishmael. Great. Call me Wisp. Now that that's out of the way, I'm going to need someone to show me how to fucking get backstage. We can't keep Huey Lewis in the news waiting. Huey Lewis was not a man to fuck around with. It was 1983 and Huey had already replaced every member of the news. Three times. Also, a little record called Sports came out and singularly changed the music game. I was led to Huey's door, and before I could lift my hand and knock, the Madison Square Garden backstage door blew open, and I was being held aloft by a giggling and frighteningly strong Huey Lewis. Look what I found! Huey bellowed. Hey, man, put him down. Yeah, you gotta put him down. Hey, put him down. Shouted two or maybe three sensible yet expendable members of the news. I was so high in the air, I just couldn't tell. Huey lobbed my flailing body into a backstage wall, my limp form collapsing onto a couch. Oh no, Turlington, you're not getting away that fast. Suddenly, I'm flying through the air again as Huey Lewis cheered and ran circles around the news. We're going on a night on the town, growled Huey. Silence. The news turned to him. It was time to fucking say something. Uh, Huey, we haven't even gone on stage yet. Uh, MSG is waiting, said Brent Spinely, or whatever his name was. I, I never really got around to meet the band. Tough shit, said Huey Lewis, and he blew a raspberry, followed oddly by Lewis mimicking sticking his thumb up his own ass over and over. The news just stared. Now, here's a fun note. The news actually played that show that night, with auxiliary percussionist Shep Grinders pretending to be Huey Lewis. It was their worst show, completely panned in the Times, and the news were quickly replaced the following month. Shep Grinders' body was never found. Anyway, where the fuck was I? All right. Thank you, Scotty. Now, I've sped down 34th Street in New York City many, many, many times. Once in Paul Simon's cool Corvette, you know, the one with the cover of Graceland on the hood. 
Another time, I stole Rick Derringer's bus. I did it once inside of a Mr. Safi ice cream truck while hiding from Rick Derringer's band after I just crashed their bus on 43rd Street. I've gone down these streets so many different ways, but never by forced piggyback by Huey fucking Lewis. This was a first. And by God, he was footing it. It usually takes me a minute per block in New York City. Huey Lewis was bounding from block to block in under 20 seconds each. He's taller than me, so maybe that's the science there. Who knows? Snow was coming down all around us as New York was under a winter storm warning that night. And I spoke a bit about that as I wrapped that night's show. God damn, that was a good show. I made Fleetwood Mac cry earlier that afternoon, and they said they'd never be back. <laughs> yeah, right. 1997 comes around and fucking Lindsey Buckingham's calling me all. Can you please promote the dance? We really need the help. So, do I do it? Yes. Do I tell Buckingham that he now owes me a favor that I can call on at any given time? You fucking know it. If I needed a sniper in Prague at a moment's notice, Lindsay would have to be my trigger man. Deals are deals. And the dance was a hit. What? Yeah. Oh, Huey Lewis. Thank you, Scotty. Huey Lewis threw me like I was a fucking sock monkey into a fresh snowdrift on 72nd Street. As I pulled myself out, Huey whispered in my face, Let's steal a car. Huey, no, I, I can't. We have a big one tomorrow on the Wisp Turlington show. Uh, Nick Nolte's coming in. We're going to have a taste test. Of what? Nick Nolte's sweet and flavored milks. You remember those? Nolte's sugar milks were only around from 83 to 1993, and by God, I miss them every day. Sure, people got sick. <laughs> Whatever. People get sick all the fucking time. Wisp Turlington didn't get sick. Put that one in your EPA report. You really drink that shit? Huey was flabbergasted, but I didn't care. Wisp knows what he wants. Huey, you play a weird fucking boogie-woogie frat house scandal rock and roll for fucking corporate dads who live in goddamn Morristown, New Jersey. Fucking dads who have families and other secret families in Arizona, they keep telling they'll be with one day. And you're fucking judging me? Boom. Crash. All of it. All I could see was Huey Lewis's lifeless body flying toward Central Park. He had been hit by a moving truck that was... Get this, being driven by Randy California from the band Spirit. You remember Spirit? Oh man, what a band. Zeppelin did them dirty. They did. Robert, Jimmy, John Paul, you fuckers should pay up. You really should. Anyway, Randy California and I locked eyes right before he sped the fuck up out of there. I get it. You hit something with your car, you go. Always. Just Go. I've done it plenty of times, and you are never caught. I slide through the snow over to Huey's body, quickly crossing Central Park Avenue, jumping over honking taxis. But it was too late. Huey was gone. I couldn't believe it. Right when he was finally baby kissing the stars. That was that. I, uh, I gathered myself as an ambulance pulled up. We'll take it from here. I watched them wheel 80s legend Huey Lewis's corpse to the ambulance in complete and total shock. The driver opened the van, and as they secured the body, I watched another Huey Lewis in the exact same fucking clothing step out of the back. So many questions ran through my mind in that moment. Who is this? Where is Huey? Does Randy California have a place around here? How can he afford that? This new Huey Lewis stared at his hands for a moment, as if it was the first time he had ever seen them. The ambulance sped down 72nd Street as Huey lifted one of his hands up to the streetlight for closer examination. It let out a robotic shriek so blood-startling that... What? Scotty, that's a word. Startling. Startling. You know what, just, just let me do my fucking thing, Scotty. Thank you. Sterling. Sterling. 
Yeah, that's real. Sturdling. You don't tell me that's not real. I'm fucking Wisp Turlington. Sturdling. Okay, pick it up. It let out a robotic shriek so blood sturdling that I fell backwards onto the Central Park sidewalk. Ah, my ass, I whimpered. Well, fuck. I shouldn't have said that. Now this Huey knew I was there. It mechanically tilted its head to the side, slowly moving up and down as if it was scanning my body. For what? Only robot Huey Lewis fucking knew. After about 15 minutes of scanning, cyborg Huey Lewis took off his suit jacket and threw it over his right shoulder. My God, the cover of sports. He's doing the fucking cover of sports. He gave me a wink and then blasted upwards into the atmosphere. In one moment, Huey Lewis was gone and then back and better than ever. I mean, he fucking had jet feet. It doesn't get better than that. You know, I saw Huey Lewis many times after that. He'd come on Rock Nights, my famous rock talk radio program, and he wouldn't say a word about that snowy New York night. I'd only know I wasn't making things up when I'd watch him fucking jet foot away from the studios after every single session. Huey, I love you. Hope I didn't step on any jet toes here. Let's get dinner soon. Chapter 2. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Well, half of that is right. Because whenever I'm visiting L.A., it's nothing but the best of times. If I'm not spending my time in a beautiful mansion I co-own with David Coverdale in Bozeman, Montana, or the avocado and marijuana farm I run in upstate New York next to my good friend Jan Hammer from Mahavishnu, I'm living that L.A. lifestyle. Just a little modest apartment above the Viper Room on the Sunset Strip. It's a place I can lay my head, listen to some great classic rock, and do lots and lots of fucking. Wisp Turlington is a man of simple needs. I like good food, great classic rock, solid conversation about classic rock on my radio show, and to test the boundaries of the flesh in an orgiastic feast for the senses on a nightly basis. And that's L.A. in a nutshell. Oh, God, who's at the door? All right, don't worry, listener. That is just a convincing sound effect of a door knocking that I'll have Scotty put in. Scotty, don't fuck this one up. But that person in this story also said knock, knock at the same time. Knock, knock. Anybody ready to bone? And that person, Ray Manzarek from The Doors. The year is 1973. Ray has moved in next door to my L.A. pad, and he is sad. Morrison has gotten fat and died, and I've been left to pick up the pieces. Pieces that when you put them together is the puzzle that is Ray Manzarek. I toured with the Doors as a roadie, confident, sage for many, many years. And I was the one that told Jim, keep doing what you are doing and never look back. And he didn't, for better or worse. And now he was dead, and Robbie needed a shoulder to cry on. And a little bit more than that. Hey, Wisp. I found out about another orgy. This one's gonna be wild. He told me as I walked into my bedroom and grabbed my strap on. Look, I was trying to be a good friend, and he needed this to get through his grief. And I needed him to shut the fuck up about Morrison. If you thought he talked about Jim Morrison a lot in interviews and on the Wisp Turlington show, you should have heard him in real life. Unhinged. And the only thing that could shut him up was a good, healthy orgy. Before you could blink an eye, we were at a mansion in Laurel Canyon that used to be owned by Don McLean riding high on American Pie money. I had done an interview with Don for my show that went great. We talked about music, love, laughter, and then it ended abruptly when he came out of the bathroom with a shriek and blood on his hands. But that's a story for a different chapter. No, Scotty, I'll tell it in a different chapter. Don't interrupt. I have mumbled a voice at the door. Ah, oh, damn it. It was Jimmy Page. I should have known. Jimmy Page? Oh, man. Hey, uh, did I ever uh, tell you about the Lizard King? 
Ray screamed as he barreled into the house. This wasn't going to be any ordinary orgy, not with Paige involved. Look, I don't care if you spell magic with a K like a weirdo or without one like Stevie Nicks. As long as you keep it out of my sex life, I am fine. It's all boning to me. I never went in for Aleister Crowley. The man couldn't carry a tune to save his life, and that is no friend of Wisps right there. Now Manson, he could sing like a bird. I even helped him write some songs for the Beach Boys, but his orgies were terrible. Life can be confusing, especially when Paige is mumbling about opening up dimensions through cum. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law? <laughs> Whatever, man. I have one law. Rock and roll is king, and Wisp is the emperor. Well, actually, that, uh, that might be two laws, but I stand behind it. But because I'm a good friend and Ray was bawling about the Lizard King again, I guess it was time to orgy. I can't and shouldn't list all of the names of the people there. But a few names, sure. Stills and Nash, no Crosby. Dusty Springfield, Sonny Bono, Robin Gibb, Meatloaf, and many other beautiful people and beautiful friends. And they were all doing the grossest things you could ever imagine. I can't get into the details, mostly because of various lawsuits. At one point, we were experiencing pain and pleasure all at once. I swear, chains came out of the walls and ripped the flesh off of Gary Brooker from Procol Harum. It was a real Cenobite situation. I, of course, told this part of the story on my radio show, and then those bastards ripped me off. My lawyers are still dealing with Clive Barker on a daily basis. Wisp is coming for you, pinhead. <laughs> Screamed out Paige as he came for the hundredth, maybe thousandth time. Is it more impressive when he pulls out that solo in Kashmir? Or when you see just how much semen he can create? Well, that's not for me to judge, but it's a real toss-up. Now, I don't know if it was the sex magic or just my imagination from the peyote Herbie Hancock provided in copious amounts. But around hour four, we had all merged into one. Literally, I don't go for metaphors. I only speak in hard truth. It was like the movie The Thing, but more sexual. And as we all came at the same time, the sky opened up. And I saw a giant lizard that pulled Ray Manzarek into the sky and took him from us. We had become one, but the pull of the Lizard King was too strong. Jim, you came for me. He yelled before he disappeared, which I thought was extra odd because Ray was standing right next to me as I watched him get pulled in, still covered in Vaseline. Oh, well that's odd, huh? He exclaimed. Yeah, no shit, I told him. Mumbled Paige. No idea what that fucker was telling me. Maybe he was telling me that Ray was replaced by a shape-shifting lizard from the fourth dimension whose job was to come to Earth and preach the word of Jim Morrison. Well, joke's on them. That guy never shut up about Morrison in the first place. Or maybe it was just the peyote talking to me. I do not know. But what I do know... It was just another normal, crazy night in Los Angeles. Holly Weird, you are the best. Don't ever change. Chapter 3, Three Men and a Wisp. I fucking realized that in those first two chapters, people fucking vanished and were replaced either by shape-shifting lizards or cyborgs. But if it actually happened to me, it's fair game for a dumb book, right? Wisp Turlington does not write fiction. Who do you mistake me for, Clive goddamn Cussler? Well, joke's on you. I only read coonts. When Wisp Turlington writes, he writes the goddamn truth. Will more people vanish in this book? Oh, buddy, I'm counting on it. I'm hoping so many aging rockers vanish that the story could be used for another, better sequel to Cocoon, the greatest movie ever. Steve Gutenberg, Don Amici, Wilford Brimley, the Dream Team. Get them back together. Stat. What, Scotty? Really? Well, shit. Explains why they won't return my calls. Gutenberg, I speak with him every single day. That's what friends do. 
<sighs> well, you just bummed me the fuck out, Scotty. If that was your intent, well done. Anyway, Gutenberg. I met Steve Gutenberg on the set of Three Men and a Baby. You remember that film? It was a huge hit for Steve Gutenberg. Also, Ted Danson in the, uh, the other one. Goddamn biggest film of the 1980s for moms and grandmothers with Tootsie coming in a close second and Baby Boom a close third. I'm sorry, Diane Keaton. Your imploding babies just didn't make the top two. I assume that's what that film was about. Never saw it. Leonard Nimoy directed Three Men and a Baby. Yep, fucking Spock himself. And get this, he wore the Spock costume the entire time. He'd sleep in it, shit in it, chase catering vans in it. For the entire shoot, he wouldn't let anyone call him Leonard Nimoy. Spock was directing that goddamn film. And when I arrived, Spock was trying to solve some big, big problems. The biggest? The film was set entirely in space. Well, this will not do. Spock, buddy, why don't you put this one on Earth? I calmly asked. Nobody's buying the space shit. You're telling me the baby was found in fucking space by three astronauts? Just fucking floating around? Come on! You gotta be fucking shitting me, Spock. You and I both know that if Buzz Aldrin had found a fucking baby in space, he would have eaten it. The room fell silent. Leonard stood up and raised his director's chair above his head, ready to strike and send me directly to hell. He then very slowly dropped the chair to his side and quietly sobbed. God damn it, he's right. Strike the spaceship set. We're doing this motherfucker on Earth. The crew was furious, and from that point on, they'd only refer to me as shit ass, yuck, stinky old dick, pretty hurtful, or face for radio. Man, that last one, brr, makes me shake to this day. How fucking dare they? Tom Selleck took off his paper mache space mask and chucked it at me. If anyone needs me, I'll be in my trailer answering fan mail for my mustache. Ted Danson was lowered to the ground. He had been suspended in midair for two hours for the penultimate baby discovering space stunt. He walked up and swiftly kicked me square in the place where I keep all of my little wisps. That's right. You guessed it. My nuts. Oh, who asked you, Turlington? Who fucking asked you, you shit? Shouted Danson as he sulked away. I think. I truly can't remember because I was too focused on the sensation of my trousers and shoes filling up with blood. All I remember was my good buddy Steve Gutenberg giving me a thumbs up. <laughs> what a guy. Our friendship was born on that day, which is good. Because from that day on... Wisp Turlington would probably no longer be able to contribute to the birthing of anything. I'd be shooting compressed air for the rest of my life. But in the end, I was right. Spock changed it from outer space to New York City and the story finally clicked. And everyone knew they had a fucking smash on their hands. He also decided to keep me on set to punch up some of the jokes. I'd work late nights while everyone else was away. I felt I got into the zone to fix those jokes when I was completely alone. After we wrapped one night, Steve stopped by on his way out the door. You sure you're good in here by yourself, Wisp? Guys and I are going to Smokehouse. Why don't you come? By guys, do you mean Ted and Tom? Uh, yeah. No fucking thank you. What are we going to talk about? Episodes of Cheers and Magnum P.I.? Yeah, that's all they talk about. They won't even let me slip in anything about Police Academy or Police Academy 25. Fucking monsters. No, I'm good here, Goots. Thank you, my friend. No, thank you. As long as you keep cranking out those perfect jokes, this film is going to win Best Picture. I can smell it. He pulled the soundstage door closed behind him. Wisp was alone. I was trying to figure out the best way to frame a baby pees on three men while they try to change a diaper joke. This pees on you. No, doesn't work. Where's the pee? A clever turn on where's the beef, but didn't work out because we knew where the pee was. It was blasting Steve Gutenberg, Ted Danson, and the mustache in the face. Three separate streams. I think that was a contractual issue. They couldn't share a stream. Who knows? Clang. Who's there? 
I call out. Clang, clang. Selleck, that better not be you. I was not in the mood for pranks, and Tom Selleck was fucking terrible at them. He tried to get me with the saran wrap over the toilet trick earlier in the day, but then forgot himself minutes later and used the trick toilet. Turlington! He screamed, covered in his own hot mess. Not my fault, man. Not my fault. Who are you? Said a ghostly small boy's voice. Who the fuck let a child on set? I shout. Silence. Suddenly I'm being held aloft in the air. What the fuck? I am Zazelthoth, demon of the underrealm, bellowed the tiny creature below me. I look down. This demon has taken the form of a smaller Ted Danson wearing a tuxedo. This is the underrealm that I speak of, and you are not welcome here. He tossed my wisp body like a sack of extremely talented rocks. This is a soundstage, demon, I groaned, regaining my composure. You mean to tell me this is not the Eighth Gate, overlooking the vast multitude that is the burning underrealm? Sorry to break it to you. This is a soundstage for a very dumb movie. Zazzletoff looked stunned. If, if this is not the gate, then I have grossly miscalculated, and I, I am stuck here forever, forever stuck within this film, right behind that curtain by the window is where I shall be. This cannot be true. Tough break, kid. Tell me, asked Zazzletoff. Is this at least a good movie that I shall be imprisoned in for eternity? Actually, it's a fucking piece of shit. Let's be real. If anyone else had asked, I would have said it was a great film. But I could feel the demon's pain. And honestly, if I was going to be stuck within a film forever, I'd want to know if it was a piece of shit fucking Ted Danson Tom Selleck vehicle. Did I mention that Steve Gutenberg was in it? And the demon was totally okay with that? Apparently, he loved Police Academy 29. But I mean, who didn't? Well, I guess I will take my place then. Human Wisp Turlington, will you do me a favor? Of course, you name it. Will you tell everyone that I am the ghost of a little boy? I want everyone to be a little frightened while watching this movie, so that a little bit of me will live on! That's a fucking weird request. Buddy, when people hear this dialogue, they're already going to be shitting their pants from fright, I responded. The demon laughed, and that was that. I honored my word with the demon, and the next day I told Spock I'm pretty fucking sure there's a little boy's ghost on set. Well, that's just fucking great, yelled Spock. I'm not dealing with ghosts again. We had to shut down Wrath of Khan for this shit. Pack it up, people. Production was shut down for three months, as Spock personally searched for the ghost himself. Eventually, he gave up, and the film was completed, and was the absolute biggest film of the 80s. I won two Oscars for it, and if you ask me to show them to you, I will kindly refuse. I'm not showing you shit. All right, Scotty, turn it on. Chapter 4. Yes, I'll have a potato. I've had many wives. I've had many lives. And if I see one fucking chive on this baked potato, I'll bash your fucking head in. That's one of my favorite inspirational quotes. From one of my favorite philosophers, me, Wisp Turlington. That's from my best-selling philosophy book, Wisp's Way is the Right Way, available at all Albertsons checkout aisles across the country. That book was great, but this one I'm currently writing, hell, it's going to be even better. And you can take that to the rock bank. Speaking of lives, when I mentioned it two paragraphs ago, I have lived many of them. Lives, that is. And I know what you're thinking. Wisp, when will we get to your life in radio? The whole reason we came here in the first place. Well, first I would say, don't question me if you know what's good for you. And second, all in due time, my good friend. Because for now, I'm hungry. Hungry for a story. Much like I was back in 1981, when I was also hungry for a different type of story called food. 
I was dining at Spago's with my good friends John Anderson and Chris Squire from the massive Prague powerhouse, yes. They were both down in the dumps and crying into their caviar and sun-dried tomato pizzas, making an already salty treat into a salty mess. What the hell is wrong with you two? You're making me want to throw up all over my foie gras and roasted sunchoke pie that Wolfgang personally prepared for me. Now, between you and me, I was ready to throw it up anyways. In the great pizza wars, I don't care what side you're on. New York, Chicago, weirdos from other places who think there is another option besides New York and Chicago. As long as it isn't pizza made by Wolfgang Puck. That man convinced a whole town of industry-sucking assholes that a pizza should have a bunch of bullshit you couldn't even donate to a food shelter all over it. You call it California cuisine. I call it water chestnuts and craisins on a pizza. But Wolfgang was one of my best friends at the time, before I stole his wife from him and he tried to run me over on the 101. (laughs) A story for another chapter. And until then, I was choking down those disgusting pies for friendship. John Anderson spit out. (laughs) Said Chris Squire. What the hell are you two talking about? I screamed at them. Talking to the head members of Yes was like talking to a bunch of Muppets. And unless Jim Henson had his hand up their asses, I didn't know what the hell they were getting at. I think they were trying to explain to me that their last album, Drama, didn't do that great, and that the world wasn't into their epic prog songs anymore, and that punk rock and MTV pop was going to take down the old greats of the progressive rock scene. Or at least that's what I think Wolfgang said when he came up to us and translated. (laughs) Is all I heard. These guys and their fucking accents. Friendship can be painful when you're the only one talking. At that point, I threw down my napkin and yelled at yes. Let's go. We are going to get some real food. Food without rat feces in it. Making sure that the entire restaurant heard me loud and clear. Between you and me, I was already eyeing Wolfgang's wife and setting the scene to destroy him down the line. But until then, he was one of my best friends and I loved him until the end of time. An hour later, me, John Anderson, and Chris Squire were scarfing down burgers at my favorite mom and pop burger joint, Wendy's. But something was off that day. I took a bite out of my burger and it tasted salty. What the fuck was going on here? Hey, yes. Are you back there crying into my burger? (laughs) Nope. Those sack of turds were still sitting in front of me complaining because no one wanted to hear them dick around on their instruments for 20 minutes anymore. The burgers were salty from tears. But those tears were from the one and only Dave Thomas, owner of Wendy's and more importantly, my good friend. He was currently getting his ass handed to him on a plate by McDonald's and Burger King. The burger wars had been bloody that year. Not as bad as the pizza wars, but (laughs) pretty bad. Dave was about to sell the entire Wendy's empire. He couldn't hack it anymore. And the straw that broke the camel's back? Some jackasses had complained that they hated these square burgers. Hey, you make it round like everybody else, you punk. Dave couldn't take it anymore. He was going to pack it in. That's when I realized I needed to step up to the plate, take out my bat, and start swinging. Literally. I bashed that man's head into the front counter of that Wendy's with my trusty baseball bat that I carry around at all times. It's a doggy dog world, and you always have to be ready to swing. That's another quote from my philosophy book, Page 54, available at all fine Albertsons. And I self-quoted out loud as the blood from that unruly customer splattered all over Dave Thomas, John Anderson, and Chris Squire. It was an act of violence I'm not proud of, but it had to be done for the sake of friendship. But the bloodshed didn't end there. Right as I was about to dip my fries into my Frosty, three other punks came in. They looked exactly like their friend who was now just a bloody smear on the wall. Hey, what the hell you doing to us friends, you guys? Screamed one of them. It was at that moment I realized this was no regular gang of New York ruffians invading the Sunset Strip. It was the Ramones. 
Well, <laughs> I mostly realized it after I had bashed their faces into jelly, curb stomping them to oblivion. <laughs> Whoops. As I tore out Johnny Ramone's heart and showed it to him before he died, I heard a high-pitched squeal behind me. John Anderson was trying to tell me something. My mama, my mama, my mama, my was he telling me that he was about to write a hit song inspired by that one lone heart called Owner of a Lonely Heart? That would be so big that it would bring the 70s prog rock giants into the MTV generation? Maybe. Like I told you, could never understand a word out of that guy. Make sure it doesn't sound anything like you guys normally sound, I screamed at them. Again, I didn't know what they were saying. That is just something I would say to yes all the time. You gotta be truthful with your friends. You just gotta be. Hey, that heart looks like a big old baked potato. Dave Thomas said out loud. He wasn't wrong. Johnny Ramone's heart was brown and had a white inner texture that oozed all over my hands when I squished it in front of him. What do you know? It truly does. Hey, I'll take mine without chives. <laughs> we all laughed about my joke because it was very, very funny. But you know what wasn't funny? Dave Thomas realizing the thing that would set Wendy's apart from the rest of those burger joints? A baked potato bar. And that's why Wendy's is the number one fast food burger restaurant in all of America. Don't look it up. You know that it's true. Yeah, that was one hell of a night. I saved Yes's career and the Wendy's franchise. Not to mention murdering all of the Ramones. <laughs> Don't worry. They were like Menudo. Just put some leather jackets and some black bangs on some guys, and even if they are murdered by a legend of rock radio, they can keep on trucking. Those weren't the first Ramones, and they wouldn't be the last. Chapter 5. Peekaboo. Freddie Mercury was one of my bestest best friends. We would hang out whenever we could, and I'd go over to his place in Kensington and eat the most amazing goddamn coronation chicken you've ever had. That was Freddie's signature dish. He'd cook it whenever I came over. It was good enough to make Queen Elizabeth say, well, shit, I should have another plate of that. I'm not making it up. I heard her say it twice. God rest her soul. Fred and I would hang out and watch old ass movies. Starring my mother, Hollywood star Regina Turlington. Uh, they mimicked a Regina Turlington photo for one of the Queen album covers. I, uh, I think it was News of the World or Jazz. I can never remember. All I remember is that Freddie Mercury was the fucking best. When he passed in 1991, I was a fucking wreck. To this day, if I hear anything off the album The Game, I become a blubbering mess. Anything off the album The Miracle? <laughs> I'm fine. Come on. Never understood the damn thing. A four-headed creature singing a song called The Invisible Man? Now that is batshit crazy. I once told Brian May about this and he scoffed. Well, maybe you just aren't smart enough to understand it. Brian, buddy, say something like that again and I'll hit you so hard you'll forget the names of every planet. And before he could respond, I changed my mind and went through with my punch, landing it square in his stomach. Puked everywhere. Hell, I even think he puked a small red guitar. There was so much mess, it was like watching a John Carpenter film. And to this day, despite being some kind of space scientist or some shit, Brian May still can't name the planets. Stars, constellations, he'll rattle that horse shit off until you wish you were in fucking space yourself, screaming for mercy. Planets? He just can't fucking do it. He quickly changes the subject or tries to convince you that the phrase, uh, Christine, look over there. Good Lord, I do believe it's a rabbit, is the name of Pluto. A whole fucking sentence. Come the fuck on, Brian. But yeah, he's an okay guy. He had my character written into their film, Bohemian Rhapsody, and I was going to be played by Hugh Grant until at the last moment, they pulled me out. Said it was too mean or some shit. I hope this life gives me one more chance to hit Brian May. In April 1992, I was invited to speak and sing the song Lazing on a Sunday Afternoon with Queen at the Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert. Sweet Christ, what a show. Wembley fucking Stadium. The site where Queen changed the world in 1985. A joint performance from Dire Straits and Sting also changed the world that day. But this chapter isn't fucking about them. I'll get to those gigantic assholes in good time. Trust me, 
I could write a book just about Mark Knopfler. He is my mortal enemy. He knows it. And when I Highlander him, I will take the prize. Oh, man. Freddie would have loved every moment of the memorial show, except for Extreme. He would have asked me to remove them, and I would have enjoyed every fucking minute of it. Yeah, Nuno? Guys? Uh, Freddie needs you to scram. Why? Why? <laughs> well, look at yourself. Maybe even listen to your fucking music. It's time to kick rocks, Nuno. Wholehearted is an okay song, though. Why wasn't it as big as More Than Words? I'll never know. It's basically the same fucking song structure. Soft bullshit with an acoustic guitar. I arrive at Wembley dressed in all black, wearing a dark leather jacket with fringe, a black button-up shirt with an upside-down cross necklace. Anyone who saw me would immediately think, this motherfucker came to rock. As my limo pulled away, another took its place, an outstep fucking Tony Iommi, dressed the exact same way as me. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Iomi pointed at me and laughed. <laughs> Samesies. Fucking Iomi. That was a brand new phrase that swept the world in 1992, actually coined by heavy metal legend and Black Sabbath founder Tony Iomi. All the metal guys were into making up new phrases in the early 90s. Ronnie James Dio had cool beans. Anthrax Scott Ian coined the phrase as if. Dave Mustaine had, looks like it's boner patrol time. And Jimmy Page had, not, and Schwing, long before Wayne's World came along. Hell, Schwing was the name of Zeppelin's In Through the Outdoor record for a good week before Jimmy was talked out of it by John Paul Jones. Personally, I still think it's a better title. Stepping out of the limo right behind Tony Iommi, god damn it. I knew I'd have to face him eventually. It was Queen bassist John Deacon. We'd had a falling out the last time I was at Wembley Stadium for Queen's triumphant dates there in 1986. It was the last time Deacon peekabooed me, and I hoped it would be the last. As for the last time he got me, he broke my fucking neck. I was in traction from 1986 to 1988, all thanks to John fucking Deacon. Oh, you're asking, Wisp, what's a peekaboo? Well, it isn't what you think. A normal human being would play peekaboo with two hands in front of their face, and then they would open their hands and say, Peekaboo! It's typically played with small children and the members of Winger. Peekaboo! Said Kip Winger, as he spun around doing some dumb fucking dance move that no one asked to see. She's only 17, and she loves a game of peekaboo. Disgusting. Absolutely fucking lutely disgusting. To John Deacon, basis extraordinaire for Queen, it was completely different. It was more of a hide-and-seek, and I believe he started this on the game tour in 1980. He'd hide somewhere within a venue, and then when someone crossed his path, he'd drop from a ceiling or from behind a beer cart and start pummeling the person as hard as he could while screaming, Peekaboo! You know, I'll walk through a grocery store and see a father with his infant son. Peekaboo! The father will say to his child, and I will freeze in my tracks, taking a defensive stance! I quickly scan the area of the Safeway I'm in. I pull out my gun. You won't fucking get me this time, Deacon! I'm no longer allowed in any Safeway, and that's okay. Because they couldn't keep me safe. Anyway, back at the limo, Deacon starts walking my way and he winks at me. I quickly grab him by the collar of his members-only jacket. I know what that wink is, you fuck! Oh, do you wisp? Do ya? Deacon snarls at me. Queen security quickly pulls me off Deacon. See you soon, Wisp. Now, I calm down, and I just assume he's referring to later on in the memorial show when I'm supposed to sing with him. But then fucking Deacon winks at me again, and I'm stunned. Silent. What is this sick fuck planning? The show starts, and it is amazing. Just a wonderful energy in the air, like Freddy's spirit was swirling all around us, whispering, It might kill you this time, Wisp. Uh-oh. Freddy. What do you mean? Oh, he's been planning it since the miracle sessions. He wants you dead, darling. It's all he talks about anymore. But why? Something about the live killers tour. And with that, he was gone. I'm sure he wanted to fly off and go to the front of the stage to watch Metallica. <laughs> what a set. And I just stood there, stunned. And then it came to me. New York, 1979. I'm backstage at the Garden. 
Everyone is partying their dicks off. Warren Beatty. Everyone from the love boat. Shelley Duvall. Earth. Wind. But no fire. It was insane. They had a children's ball pit just filled to the brim with cocaine. I jumped in. Snort, snort. Gobble, a gobble. I'm the fucking king of New York. I climb my way out of the coke pit and lock eyes with John Deacon. He smiles as if he wants to be friends. I, in a coke-fueled rage, punch him square in the jaw while screaming, Tag! You're it! Deacon recoils in pain while eight of his teeth fly into the air. I catch all of them using the magic of cocaine to slow down time. This is a real thing. Look it up. My teeth! Whips! My fucking teeth! Cried Deacon. Goddamn blood everywhere. They're mine now, Deaky! Boom. Replay over. I'm back at Wembley 1992, and I am immediately fishing through the pocket of my trousers. Oh, God, please don't be in there. Please don't be in there. But God damn it, there they were. Eight perfect John Deacon teeth. From the stage, Deacon quickly looked my way, as if he could sense the teeth were there. Queen was about to break into Las Palabras de Amor. But instead, Deacon throws his bass down and jumps at least 100 feet. The crowd thought it was part of the show. Brian and Roger knew what was happening and motioned for Tony Iommi to run over and fill in on bass. <laughs> Same piece, said Iommi, not understanding that this phrase really doesn't work in this situation. I start running faster than I ever have. And before you know it, I'm standing at the bottom of the stairs outside the front of Wembley Stadium. I'm safe. I made it. But then I looked to the top of Wembley, and there he was, John fucking Deacon. In one swift movement, he flies toward me, knocking me to the ground. And he holds me up and punches me into the sky. peek a -boo. I land on top of a black cab. Oi, get off me fucking cabe, shouted the cabbie right before Deacon snapped his neck. I qu quickly tried to limp away. But Deacon picks up the black cab and throws it at me. Ugh. Landing on top. This is it, I think. I'm finally going to die at the hands of John Deacon. peek a Howls Deacon as if he was some funky bass-playing demon. As he lifts the cab off me, he sniffs my broken body while laughing under his breath. He sniffs my pocket and rips my trousers clean off of me. In any other situation, I would be embarrassed being butt-ass naked on the streets of London. But in this case, there was so much blood and broken bone all over me. It was like I was wearing a pair of truly gruesome-looking pants. He rips into the trousers, pulling out eight perfect John Deacon teeth. He opens his demon mouth and shoves all of them back into place. He sits next to me, and slowly, his demon breathing becomes a thing of the past and he is transformed back into a mild-mannered bassist named John Deacon. Sorry, it had to come to this wisp. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Wanna go back inside? Sure, I'd like that. And in one movement, Deacon picks up the bag of bones known as Wisp Turlington and hurls me back toward Wembley Stadium. I fly through the opening of the roof and crash onto the stage at the feet of Tony Iommi who quickly notices and gets excited that we are both wearing the same style of Nike trainers. <laughs> same Ha 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 You bastard. You got it right that time, Tony Iommi. You got it right that time. Chapter 6. My Mama's Meatloaf. If you fuck with my mother's meatloaf recipe, I will break your fucking kneecaps! Wow. Hold up, Wisp. Yes, Wisp? First off, you are looking great as you write your autobiography and or recording the audiobook for your autobiography? Ah, <laughs> thanks, me. Right back at you. Of course, Wisp. But Wisp, I gotta throw in my two cents. Yes, it's true that some people think stories are better when they start at the end, like the movie Memento, which I helped write. But take a note from old Wisp Turlington, Wisp Turlington. I think this story might be best to start at the beginning. Just like my original draft of Memento, before that turd Nolan messed with my vision. A backwards movie? <laughs> That's stupid. Well, you're the author, Wisp. I'm just here for my dashing good looks. 
<laughs> Wisp, you get me with that every time. So where was I? Ah, yes, at the beginning. The year was 1965 and I was hanging out in jolly old England. Uh, but unfortunately, it wasn't so jolly for old Wisp. You see, I was going through a divorce. Now, it wasn't my first, and it wouldn't be my last. But this one stung. Yeah, those two days I was married to Nico were some of the happiest I ever had. Mostly because of the sex. Not with her. We never actually consummated the marriage. Yeah, I was too busy getting into a bunch of orgies in those two days. Wild, passionate orgies. That started right after the wedding toast. Who am I to turn down a congratulatory orgy? I'm only human. I don't know. Maybe I was at fault for the marriage failing. I still think somehow the answer is, no, it wasn't my fault. It was probably Lou Reed somehow. And that's why I'll never forgive him. So there I was in England, licking my wounds and licking an ice cream cone. When who do I run into but my good friend Sid Barrett? Oh, Wisp. Fancy a lick? Now, I knew Sid from his little-known skiffle band, The Soppy Lads. I used to play their single Sunshine Train Station on my radio show, and I hated it. Badmouthed it every time I played it, and Sid always respected me for that. And ever since then, he looked up to me, kind of like a mentor. A mentor who would spit in his face at every turn. Literally. <laughs> Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> I may have hated his music, but I loved this straight-laced kid. Not enough to give him any ice cream. I don't share a cone with anyone. Not even with my ex-wife, Nico, while I'm in the middle of an orgy. Lou Reed told her that was wrong, and fuck that guy. Cut to, I'm at Sid's practice space. He has a new band the world hasn't heard of yet. Pink Floyd. What a dumb name. Right away, I ask them, Hey, which one's pink? I laugh and laugh and laugh because a funny joke deserves laughter. What is a world without laughter? Probably a Velvet Underground rehearsal. Luckily, the rest of the band all chime in with raucous laughter, so I repeat it. No, seriously, uh, which one's pink? Roger Waters takes out his notebook. Well, I'm going to remember that little nugget, Wisp. Speaking of which, I'm still waiting for my royalties for Have a Cigar, Roger, and I will get them. So help me, Christ. But I wasn't angry at him then. No way. Richard Wright was getting all the wisp wrath because that motherfucker wasn't laughing at all. Just twinkling around on his dumb keyboards. He can never take a joke. But I wasn't going to let that stop me. I got right up in his face and yelled at him. Which one's pink? Nothing. Not a smile. Not today, Wisp. He whispered, stone-faced. Sorry about that, Wisp. Richard's a tough nut to crack, said Roger. Always the most reasonable member of the bunch. Which is why when I told him, that guy ever gives you shit, you pay him like an employee. Nevertheless, they want me to play some of their new tunes. So I sit back, put my legs up, and yell out, Make me happy! And two seconds in... I am not happy. It is awful. When you've been around as long as I have, you can tell if a band is great or terrible within two seconds. Like all good art. And Sid's new band was about as good as the Velvet Underground. And that's bad in Wisp's book. My book. That I'm writing now. Lucky for them, I had some of my mother's meatloaf on me. That's right. I don't need to explain to you, the reader, about Regina Turlington's meatloaf. She has turned it into a frozen meatloaf empire known throughout the world as simply Mama Turlington's Loaf. A secret recipe passed down from Turlington to Turlington, and I always kept it in my pocket to munch on. Now, I'm not a religious man. Sure, I've dabbled in them all, but my true religions? One, of course, is classic rock, and numero tumero, my mother's meatloaf. It can change your perception on the world when you eat it, probably because of its secret ingredient. It was lysergic acid, a.k.a. LSD. Mama was spending a lot of time with this guy I just called Uncle Timmy. You may know him as Timothy Leary. He was the same age as me, so it was weird I called him uncle. But it wasn't weird how I felt when I ate that meatloaf. Free, open to the world and beyond. To worlds beyond my mind. That is one damn good meatloaf. This is real tasty, Wisp. 
Sid said as he munched it down. Whoa, I can feel me mind expanding. Ugh, this kid was about to be tripping balls. I forgot that he had never done a drug in his life. His tolerance was not like old Wisps. It was at this moment I realized I needed to split. Because I didn't want to stick around and hear his terrible band anymore. Before I left, I yelled out, Hey, which one's pink? Because I know jokes are better when repeated like a catchphrase. It might have been the meatloaf, but everyone was laughing. Except right. I'll come for you next. Flash forward a couple weeks and I see a flyer for some psychedelic rock show. The Electric Strawberry Elephant Experience, or as I like to call it, Bullshit Word Salad. Look, here's my feeling on psych rock. You call it an exploration into the inner soul through sound. And I call it, you couldn't write a riff to save your fucking life. But lo and behold, who do I see on the bill? Good old Pink Floyd. So I decided to pop in on my old friends as I popped another slice of mama's loaf into my mouth. As I tried to slide through a sea of marijuana smoke and colored lights, I could feel the loaf kicking in. The world had started swirling around me. I was seeing colors I had never seen before in my life. I also swore I saw Paul Simon riding Art Garfunkel through the crowd like a horse. Hey, Wisp. How's it swinging? (laughs) <laughs> Not well, Art, because I was tripping balls on meatloaf. It was at that moment my ears were pierced with the most god-awful racket. Yep, it was Pink Floyd. They had changed their music since I had last seen them. And it was worse. Just dicking around up there on their guitars while Sid stared into the middle distance. I recognized that look. I had seen it a million times. This guy had been eating Mama's meatloaf. And I was pissed. Again, this is before the Turlington Loaf Empire had swept the world. This guy was making his own loaf. And I wasn't happy. Hey, Sid, you been bootlegging my mama's loaf? I screamed at him. He stared at me with dead eyes. That little boy was no longer there. Sid was gone as he took a bite out of the meatloaf in his hand. Is that fucking raisins in it? This motherfucker had not only stolen my mother's meatloaf recipe and clearly put way too much LSD in it, but he also added raisins? Well, that just set me off. You cross a line when you cross Regina Turlington. So I scream out, if you fuck with my mother's meatloaf recipe, I will break your fucking kneecaps. The music stops. Dead silence. Everyone is looking at me, including Paul Simon who is now being ridden like a horse by Art Garfunkel. Richard Wright stands up, points at me, and yells out, Which one's pink, Wisp? And everyone laughs. That motherfucker. The joke doesn't even make sense in this context. But the entire band takes it as a rallying cry. They clearly had all been eating Mama's meatloaf and were all tripping balls. The war had begun between Pink Floyd and Wisp Turlington. So I do the only thing I can do. I pull out a sword made of pure rainbow energy. Sid breaks his guitar in two like an egg and out pops a little gnome. And that gnome is ready to fight. Get him, Grimble Crumble. Now, there's one thing I hate more than psych music. And one thing I hate even more than Lou Reed stealing my ex-wife. It's a lack of respect. All that I had given Sid in this band. All the great ideas and this is how they treat me. There can be only one! I yell out to the sky as me and Grimble Grumble fight to the death. His death. As his head gets chopped off by my rainbow sword, Sid drops before me. Clearly some weird symbiotic acid relationship. Who knew? Roger Waters comes out from behind the amp he is hiding behind. And god damn it, if that tall motherfucker doesn't grow to ten feet tall! And we wrestle each other on a sea of flowers until I choke him to death on a beautiful purple lily. Nick Mason's handlebar mustache grows into two serpents and wraps around me. But I break free and choke him on his own facial hair. And then, finally, it's me and Richard Wright. Mano e mano. Well, sort of. I haven't changed, but now Richard has morphed into a wild pink blob dissolving everything that comes into contact and screaming out some awful sound. I am 
prank. Oh, yeah, that's why he didn't laugh. The joke cut too close to the bone. I get that. I don't know if it was the LSD or the murdering of all of Pink Floyd, but I felt like something had been opened up and learned a little something. Sometimes jokes hurt, and I apologized to Richard that day. Because Wisp is a big man sometimes, with an even bigger heart. I still murdered him with my rainbow sword, but I did apologize. I think we all learned a lesson that day. Flash forward two months later and I wake up in Nico's bed and I have a splitting headache. Babe, uh, uh, what happened? You had a bad trip, my darling, she said with a smile on her face. Wow, it was at that moment I wondered, did any of this happen? Was it all some crazy meatloaf acid trip that went wrong? Did I make all of that up? Did I ever even meet Pink Floyd, let alone murder them in some psychedelic bloodbath? Who am I? What is my place in the universe? What is reality? Now, I don't know any of the answers to those questions, but I do know this. I stopped putting LSD in Mama's meatloaf after that day, but I will never, ever put raisins in it. So watch your back, Pink Floyd.